Thank you. Well, hello. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Beth Vargas. I'm joining, unfortunately, not in person this evening, but from the Center for International Programs at SUNY, well, at SUNY New Paltz. It's a pleasure to welcome members of the Foreign Policy Association and SUNY Global Engagement students and alumni, as well as other guests for this evening's speaker series. The Global Engagement Program has been recognized as a signature SUNY program, advancing our goal of global learning for all, educating for a sustainable future. GEP fosters global citizenship by providing students with immersive global affairs internships, a research colloquium, weekly international affairs seminars, and events like the one this evening. This week, the US Department of State and US Department of Education joined to celebrate International <laughs> Education Week, promoting programs that prepare Americans for a global environment and attracting future leaders from around the world to study and learn together. The theme for International Education Week this year is engaged, resilient, global. Those words define our speaker this evening. Elizabeth Allen is a proud native of Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, and a magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa graduate of SUNY Geneseo. She was sworn in as the Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Global Public Affairs on September 13th. Ms. Allen's impressive biography highlights her career of public service that includes communication planning in the Obama White House. She was Vice President Kamala Harris's communications director in the Biden-Harris presidential campaign. She has held roles in the State Department's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, focusing on public diplomacy, the impact of people-to-people -people diplomacy, exchange programs, and international education. We are so pleased that you could join us this evening for a discussion of US foreign policy priorities under the Biden administration. Thank you for coming and welcome. Uh, I'm really looking forward to being here. It's really an honor to be, I didn't know the first SUNY alum to speak. And so I feel a very close personal connection with, um, with our students here in particular. And it was important to me to spend some time in the beginning talking a little bit about my job and about public diplomacy writ large and how it fits into um, foreign policy work. But really, I also asked when I was asked to speak here if we could spend a lot of time on Q&A and I'm eager to talk about what you all are interested in and use this as your time. Um, I'm a pretty open book on my work, on my path um, and anything that's happening in the world today. So hopefully um, we'll get some time to talk to each other. Um, I'm very, very proud to be here as a representative of the Biden administration, of the US government, um, of the State Department, but as that native of Buffalo, as Beth said, I still have a 716 area code and I have managed to get Bill's Mafia tweets into my official Twitter account stream, so I feel good about that. Um, but I'm really honored to be here as a SUNY alum, as I said, and as a SUNY Geneseo graduate. Um, I really do believe that our experiences and our networks are what shape our values and our interests. Um, and I certainly feel like my SUNY experience did that for me, which I'm happy to talk about as much or as little later on as people are interested in. Um, but the whole point about our experiences and our networks shaping our values and our interests is what I really wanted to talk about today because it's directly related to my mandate of public diplomacy within the broader State Department agenda. When most people think about diplomacy, all of you, I'm sure you think about handshakes, formal flags, maybe the UN, and picturing diplomats sitting across from each other at a table. I have certainly done that. Our leaders spend a lot of time doing that. And that is definitely still the bread and butter of our American diplomacy. But I would offer that that paints a very incomplete picture. Increasingly, it's very important for us to be engaging publics directly to shape international outcomes. Because it's not just that societies reflect the values and interests of their governments, but that their government should be reflecting the values and interests of the societies. So how do we talk to those societies? How do we make sure that we're engaging with people to inform those values and those interests? We need to use every lever of our power, including soft power from our cultures, and institutions in society, much like SUNY, this very esteemed institution of higher learning, 
um, to advance our interests in the world. That is public diplomacy. And as many of you are involved in, as you've heard from Beth and other speakers, those exchange programs, um, media engagement, people to people ties, reaching people where they are, that's what we're gonna talk about here today. Public diplomacy is many things. It's communicating on social media, like my team has done recently, uh, creating stories on Instagram around COP26 in Glasgow, or um, you know, creating uh, content around global vaccine delivery for the pandemic. It's certainly media interviews and not just traditional media interviews, but um, you know, expanding beyond the traditional media space to, to reach influencers like YouTube creators um, many of you um, or, you know, your contemporaries and, and younger siblings certainly know that people get information everywhere. So it's just as important for Secretary of State Tony Blinken, my boss, to talk to YouTube creators, for example, about democracy building across the world, as it is for him to answer questions from the Washington Post and the New York Times. We have to do both. Um, as an example of unconventional engagement, we recently had USAID Administrator Samantha Power do a virtual conversation with The Weeknd, the singer who many of you know, whose parents are from Ethiopia. And they talked about the humanitarian crisis there. And it was advancing our goal of raising awareness and encouraging support for the disaster relief fund there. Public diplomacy is people to people exchanges, as you've heard today, and as International Education Week raises awareness of. Um, it's those personal experiences, whether it's a formal study abroad program like Fulbright, or whether it's a professional exchange program like our State Department International Visitor Leadership Program, lots of acronyms at the State Department, guys, um, which brings generations of leaders, activists, innovators, and, uh, and, and practitioners to the United States for education opportunities, for mentorship, for relationship building with their American counterparts. Um, public diplomacy is also these more informal community and societal interactions with people. So for example, Secretary Blinken recently returned from a trip to South America. And when he was there in Bogota, Colombia, he met with a very prominent local musician for a digital video and for content to be able to put out. Secretary Blinken himself is a very enthusiastic amateur guitarist. So he was able to string a little bit on the strums of a guitar, but it was very important to us to be able to show him as a US leader in a light separate from those diplomatic meetings that we all think about sitting across the table from his counterparts. We have to find ways, and what my bureau finds ways to do is to illustrate that we all have much more in common than we have different and that it's through those shared experiences that we can create ties on the harder issues. It's also our hometown diplomats program. And maybe you or your families have heard of this where we have foreign service officers, our diplomats at the State Department, or civil servants go back home and speak to their local schools or community centers about their careers, about their foreign policy priorities of, of the US government and connecting the dots to why foreign policy matters to American audiences. I wanna talk about that more um, later on as well. Um, but I think one thing we're really trying to do is explain how US foreign policy directly connects to Americans' lives. I highlight all of these types of engagements because they are all a critical element of meeting people where they are. And by that, I mean all of these new ways to meet people where they're getting their information. You all know that in addition to our information marketplace being very segmented, we are all crushed with a deluge of information that's very hard to cut through. And we can only hope to do that if we're constantly innovating and finding new people and new voices to talk about US foreign policy priorities to audiences around the world. I do wanna take a minute that as we're talking about all of these unconventional and innovative ways to reach people that we don't lose sight of the role of the traditional media. Um, the US in particular really supports a robust and free press at home and abroad, as you all know. And so not only is it important to use um, the press to communicate our message, but frankly, it's also important optically that we as the US are a leader in standing up at a podium, taking questions, being accountable to the people we serve, um, you know, and showing that we can be transparent. So whether it's the Secretary of State, Ned Price, our State Department spokesperson, um, or others, we are constantly engaging with the media. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about media relations and things if that's interesting to people. 
I think we, you know, it's clear. I'm going to skip this whole paragraph because we've talked about how, um, given the way people receive information, we have to be doing both the traditional and the innovative um, engagements in media and public diplomacy. I would highlight just a couple examples of what I've seen as really successful public diplomacy because we can talk about all these concepts. But I think it's important to illustrate how this comes to life. Um, one example is in 2015 when I was working at the State Department at that moment for the very bureau that's actually sponsoring International Education Week. We had Secretary, I'm sorry, Susan Rice, who was then National Security Advisor, um, bring together a group of youth from Israel and then also a group of Palestinian youth for a basketball game on the White House basketball court. And that's not just a nice thing to do for them. It's a really important example of bringing people together who represent one of the most intractable foreign policy crises of this century and the last century um, and really start to foster understanding among students. And again, this idea that through common experiences, we can make inroads for future leaders on the really hard and tractable issues. Um, you know, we see a lot of world leaders who've been exchange program alumni of our, of our U.S. exchange programs. Um, it's in the hundreds of world leaders that we have, we have put on U.S. government-sponsored exchange programs when they were either students or young professionals that have then gone on to be leaders around the world, which ultimately creates much better ties for the United States to have people who've gone through an experience where they know Americans, they've understood American values, and we've been able to share ideas. Um, one project that I'm particularly proud of is um, in 2016 when President Obama sat down with Anthony Bourdain in Vietnam. Um, some of you who maybe have been fans of the show um, may have seen that, but that was a project that I sponsored um, or helped put together when I was working in the White House. And, you know, at the time, it was, of course, an interview for his TV show. But one of the reasons why we felt it was so important to do it was that the whole point, as any of you who may have watched Bourdain's shows, is to get out into communities, sample local food, talk about hard issues, and talk about the very thing that I'm here to talk about today. This idea that public diplomacy means that we are getting people into communal community and societal settings to share a common experience. And to have President Obama and Anthony Bourdain do that themselves and sit at stools and drink a beer with no jackets at a restaurant that now still has that menu item <laughs> on their wall as a tribute to the president and Anthony Bourdain. The people in Vietnam remember that much more than anything that happened at any bilateral meeting that entire trip five years ago, or anything that President Obama said, or anything that the Vietnamese leader said. But experiences like that can really leave an imprint on people um, and get them thinking about issues and values. So when we think about things like media engagement, we're also thinking about the legs of such an experience um, if there is a community and societal effect. I'm almost done here. I don't want to keep talking at you. Um, just practically speaking, I'll talk a little bit about my role and how we do some of these things I've been talking about. Um, I have the honor of serving as Assistant Secretary of State for Global Public Affairs, as it's been said. And it's our bureau in the State Department that's dedicated to managing all of these public diplomacy efforts alongside our sister bureau, Educational and Cultural Affairs, that does all the exchange programs. Um, my bureau has 420 people in it in DC and in New York. I was actually able to meet with our New York team here today. They're housed in the New York and the UN building. Um, and we also have public affairs officers at every embassy across the world. There's 171 embassies across the world and there's additional consulates and joint missions. And so everywhere we have an embassy, we have a team of public affairs officers, of cultural affairs officers who are doing the critical work in the field to carry out everything I've talked about here because Lord knows they know a lot more about their audiences and about what messages are going to resonate rather than we do in DC sometimes. So part of my job, and this is something I've been focused on since I've come in, is helping set the priorities from Washington and helping give people strategic guidance, but really entrusting our field of diplomats and foreign service officers to carry this work forward. As I said, a top priority of our bureau is to talk to international audiences. We have foreign language spokespeople um, in six media hubs around the world. So it may be interesting to all of you to know that in my bureau, employed by the US government, we have Spanish-speaking, um, Spanish um, Russian-speaking, many languages across the world, uh, spokespeople who can, who can reach native speakers in these regions. I just returned from Brussels last week. It was a really interesting trip. And it was very eye-opening to me to hear from people across Europe 
how influential our U.S. government-sponsored Russian language Twitter account is. Because if they're not hearing it from us, who else are they hearing it from when oftentimes the alternative is state-run media? So again, just an example of how we're trying to meet people where they are and make sure that the, as the government, which admittedly has sometimes traditionally been behind the curve on innovation, we are constantly trying to get ahead of figuring out how people are getting their information. In addition, our embassies um, host movie screenings, art exhibits, invite American speakers in, and coordinate English classes to share our US policy and values. We bring in media, think tanks, academics, and experts to talk to each other and to US government officials around the world. I will tell you that as part of a three-day program in Brussels last week, I met with my counterparts from Belgium, from the EU, from NATO, from the UK, from Canada, and from Spain. And those were all very useful meetings. But the thing that I found the most interesting on the whole trip that I think was most useful to our embassies in Belgium and across Europe was a civil society roundtable. And we had we had leaders of think tanks, we had academics, we had reporters, we had experts come in, we had the head of Twitter in Belgium, we had the head of Politico in Europe come in and talk to us about what they're hearing, what are they hearing from their clients, what are they hearing from their readers, what do we need to be doing better as the US government, what do we need to know about? Um, and those that listening component is really, really important. This is a two-way stream of information. And I think traditionally governments have not been as good at that. It's something that this administration and that me and my team are very committed to. It's part of why I'm so happy to be here today, hearing from all of you. One of the last things I'll say is that um, under this administration and particularly Secretary Blinken, we are prioritizing talking to US domestic audiences. There are all kinds of legacy, legal, financial, and congressional appropriations reasons why we as the State Department have some limitations on being able to talk to a US audience, but we are pushing on those limits because as you all know from your studies, um, the, you know, the distinction between US domestic policy and US foreign policy is no longer stark, right? Um, you know, if you're a, a, a soybean farmer in Iowa, it really export controls and trade practices really matter to you. If you're a world traveler, um, understanding what our travel restrictions are, especially in this day and age with COVID, but really anytime, and how to manage consular services is critical. Or if you're a student, a SUNY student or otherwise, um, and you are just looking to understand better what the Biden administration's foreign policy priorities are, it is incumbent upon us to do better about reaching domestic audiences. Um, ultimately, what this administration would say is that US foreign policy is meant to make Americans' lives better, fairer, more prosperous, um, and more secure, right? I think that American publics have tended to grow up thinking about foreign policy as something happening over there, right? But really, foreign policy is happening all in our own backyard, and it's incumbent upon us to do a better job of telling that story. I think a final point I want to make, this gets back to my point about two-way information sharing, is that um, as we think about public diplomacy, uh, you know, we are thinking about how to modernize uh, diplomacy as well, right? So um, there are challenges in this 21st century that we have not had to confront until these last few years, whether it's um, pandemics coming back, um, you know, cyber issues, um, the, you know, proliferation of emerging technology like AI. And one thing that we're doing under this administration is really trying to modernize diplomacy and modernize the workforce that carries out foreign policy to meet these challenges of the 21st century, lest we get left behind. And so we are really pushing on trying to make sure that we are working with our allies and partners, really emphasizing the importance of multilateralism and working together to meet these challenges, because we as the United States, for as much in a position of strength as we sit on most issues, we certainly don't sit in a position of strength on every issue. And that position of strength often depends on us being able to work with our allies and partners to meet these challenges. And so again, it means that we have to be listening and we have to be collaborative. Um, Secretary Blinken said, quote, too often our communication our diplomacy is a one-way street. We have to do more listening. It's not just the right thing to do. It's the necessary thing to do. We need ideas and we need buy-in. So with that, I'm almost done. But um, that is why I'm here and very grateful to have this exchange of ideas. I do just want to spend one minute talking about all of you, the students in particular. Um, it's been a few years since I was a SUNY student. Um, I miss Geneseo. I did not get rid of my Buffalo area code, like I said. Um, and my SUNY experience is very close to my heart. I remember though very clearly uh, sitting where you sit now, especially as a senior, thinking about what's next, 
Um, did I take the right classes? Did I have the right major? What is my first job going to be out of college? It's going to set the tone for the rest of my life. And I'm here to tell you that that is not true because my first job when I graduated was going back to being a waitress at Outback Steakhouse, which I had done for the last four summers. And let me also just tell you that being a waitress at Outback Steakhouse might be my favorite job I've ever had. <laughs> but I want to just say that out loud because I think it's really important um, you know, to try to lift a little bit of weight off of everyone's shoulders that the foundation you're putting in place now will serve you for years and years to come. And that as you think about the short term, think about a little bit of risk tolerance to try new things, figure out what interests you and what you're good at and how you can find something that marries that together. I am very happy to talk more about careers and career paths if that's helpful later. But I just want to say out loud, I think it's important for some people like me to say, of course, I never thought I'd work in the White House, let alone twice or have my third job at the State Department. 16 years ago, I was an intern at the State Department. And it's incredibly humbling to be standing up here today as a presidentially appointed assistant secretary. All I wanted when I was a senior in college was to be a State Department intern, and I thought that would be it for me. And so I'm a good example that you never know what's gonna happen. Try to play the long game, not the short game, and know that relationships really matter. I think especially in places like DC, um, whether it's government um, or, or, or outside of government, and this is true of a lot of high pressure industries as well, people tend to de deprioritize relationships because they think if I have a short-term gain, that'll get me ahead. And I'm here to say, prioritizing your relationships and your network and thinking about the future um, and playing the long game will, will really serve you well. And again, I'm happy to get into any more of that that's helpful. Um, so I hope that some of you choose careers in foreign affairs at the State Department or otherwise. Um, but if it's one thing I hope you take away from today, I hope you all feel like it is incumbent upon all of us to tell the story of America's values and interests. And you don't need to be a diplomat to be a public diplomat. So no time to start um, like a day like today to tell America's story. And um, I hope that my work and my team can help you do that. With that, I'm so thrilled to take your questions. Let's do it.